the disciples were first called Christians. Hello, family. So awesome <clears throat> that the Lord calls us together. Thank you, Kirkland, for reminding us about being reminding, did, about remembering. We need remembered, I mean remembering. I mean, we need to be reminded because we don't remember like we ought to remember. What a, what a brilliant thing God has done in letting us start every week of our lives. Every week of our lives is started by saying, Jesus died on the cross for me. That most important event in all history is the beginning of every week we have. It's genius, it's, it's, it's wonderful. We are excited uh, this morning to, to be together on all sorts of, for all sorts of different subjects and all sorts of different reasons. The relationships in the congregation, uh, the, the collection of, of funds to help people go out from here to keep our work here going, but, but it is more palpable sending out a, a church family uh, to a, a field. We have missionaries coming to Alaska and we get to help them. We have missionaries coming from here and going out to other places and we get to help them. This is the first Sunday for James and Andrea and the family. This is their first Sunday today in Albania and they met with the church in, ah, uh, oh, I forget, Toronto, thank you. See, remembering. They expect to be there for about three months as they get settled in the country before moving down to Barat where they'll work uh, longer term. Uh, so they were, he said, they said they were richly and warmly welcomed this morning uh, and they were taken out this evening for very, very, very strong coffee. So, uh, so we are thrilled and obviously we've asked them to bring the love of, of you all uh, there. We've been talking about being a church with a heart for missions. And, we, and this, this lesson was begun the last weekend that the Smiths were here, uh, but letting James have time to speak and me time to speak, we weren't able to get very far into the lesson. And we asked, could we be an answer to Jesus' prayer? Jesus answers our prayers, God answers our prayers, can we answer his prayer? And we read John 17, the entire chapter of John 17 is Jesus' prayer. He praises God, he prays for his apostles, and he prays for the effect of their work. And then he says in verse 20, John 17, verse 20, I'm not asking on behalf of these alone, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they all may be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Jesus is praying for you that you are united, that you and I are one, that we are, that we are the united body of his, his church who's one. Those who come to him because of the teaching the apostles did, and of course that's what we're holding when we hold the New Testament. We're holding examples of their lessons, we're holding their letters to the church, we're holding their teachings. That we, because of these teachings, can be one. And of course, the church overall in the last 2,000 years, the church has done a terrible job. It's an embarrassing thing to talk about. You go to speak to somebody who's not following Christ, 
and you say, you, it's so wonderful to follow Christ. And they might look at you and say, why? So you can have an argument with somebody about it and divide again. We have thousands and thousands and thousands of different groups, different types of churches that have divided up. It's an embarrassment. I don't know how God can possibly work it out, but he's God and he does those things. He begs us, teaches us, warns us to follow the word, to be faithful to all of his teachings. Jesus's, some of Jesus' last words were asking us to be careful to follow all that he commanded us. Well, you and I can't make those decisions. We can't go back hundreds of years into Europe or into some other place and say, no, 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 don't divide. Just go back to the word. Just follow the word. We can't do uh, 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 corrective actions to the place where we grew up, to the congregation that may have had a difficulty. But we can do something here and now. And the only choices I can make are for this guy standing here. I make choices from my heart, my mind, my thoughts, my words, my actions. Not only do I, but I must, and oh, by the way, I am responsible for everything I do and everything I fail to do. And <clears throat> so are you. We are free. We make free choices. And when Jesus says, Father, I pray that they may all be one, he's laying it in your laps to say, you get to answer this prayer of mine. Your free choice to obey him and his word, to reconcile with one another, to be serving and loving and devoted to one another. Just like Jesus and, and, and God are intertwined with each other he asks us Jesus only has incredibly high standards I mean like infinitely high standards oh by the way just be completely united like God and I are he says huh yeah I'll get right on that but isn't that awesome you know when Jesus gives us love to apply when are you done loving someone you're never done. When are you done growing in Christ's love? Never. Does it get worse or better? Uh, it's painful sometimes, but it always gets better. If you're growing in his love, it always gets better. When are you done serving? Hopefully never. You can get selfish and sit on your, uh, in your couch and cross your arms and say, oh, nope, not doing it. I'm not going to do it. You can be done that way. But like love continually grows and gets better, so does serving and deeper and more significant. And what's the greatest service you can give to someone else? Uh, then you'll be done. That's when you lay your life down for them. No greater love does he than this, that he lays his life down down one for another. That's the greatest love that Jesus, as Jesus described it to us. The greatest thing we do is to die for someone else. And so when you live for someone else and die daily, as Kirkland led us to in a few minutes ago, I've been crucified with Christ. I have been crucified, past tense. When we serve one another, and I was just challenging us that to start this pathway of unity, start it right here. It's, it's in your own life. It's in your own choices. And the place to start it, the place to be passionate about it is in your home. In your home. Be lovingly united compassionate, pulling together in your marriage. God made us one when he made us husband and wife. One. We're to be united in our marriages. Both wife and husbands, Ephesians 5, we're not going to go into this. Both wife and husband are looking to Christ 
in the way they look to each other. To be that united, loving, bonded, serving entity, that powerhouse, both glorifying God himself in Genesis chapter 2, Marriage is patterned after God himself and marriage is patterned after Christ in the church in Ephesians chapter 5 and all throughout the New Testament. The greatest being ever is, is being reflected in our marriage and the greatest event ever is being reflected in our marriages. That our unity starts at home. Don't be satisfied with a mediocre relationship with your husband or wife. Don't be satisfied with mediocre relationships with your children. Love them, serve them, lift them up, encourage them. Pull together, pray together, read together, together, serve the Lord together. Let our families and our marriages be powerhouses of unity and then bring that together here. That we're never satisfied with mediocre relationships in the body. That we're one. Look at Ephesians, uh, that you all may be one. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience bearing with one another in love being diligent to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Paul is begging the church, teaching the church, giving the church a basis for their unity. The basis for humility is, is walking in service to the Lord in all humility. I'm not talking to him. It's his problem. He's the one who caused it. In all humility and gentleness. Why should I go to him? He needs to come to me and apologize. Why should I talk to her? You know she's going to talk about it to somebody else. In all humility and gentleness. I see very, very, very few of those kind of divisions in this congregation. But sometimes we just get to sit on our hands and say, Hi, how you doing? Fine, thanks, see ya. Let's not be satisfied with mediocre unity. Let's look for passionate unity. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. Where to be a congregation completely united in mind, and thought, having unity. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Starting in verse 1. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ... If any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship in the spirit, if any affection and compassion make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves." Is there any encouragement in Christ? Is there? Yes. Is there any consolation in love? Yes. Is there any fellowship in the Spirit? Yes. Is there any affection and compassion? I hope so. Paul says, make my joy complete. Be completely united. Be of the same mind. Maintain the same love. Be united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Don't be selfish. When you, now this is written to the church, but imagine applying that back to what I, where we started. Imagine applying that to your family. Our family used to huddle up. We'd literally huddle up in the kitchen. Carol and I and however many children were home at the time. And we would call 
out some of these verses or the verse of the day or of the week and say, okay, let's apply that. Imagine reading that. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but in humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. You practice that. In, and it's necessary in your closest relationship so that the, that the body can know that. We're talking about being a church, being a church that's mission-minded and being a church that's united. So that w- whether it's somebody driving to Fairbanks next weekend, and we, you know we borrow every one of your vacations, Every trip or vacation you have, we, we, we jump in the back seat of your, of your car or the next seat next to you in the airplane because we want to go with you as, as the love of God's church. We want you to carry the love of Christ. We want to be an encouragement wherever you go, whether it's to work tomorrow morning or, or to the Bahamas uh, next month because you want to get some, some warm vacation before the winter gets too long. Make that a proclamation of Christ that becomes a mission trip because you are Christ's and you bring the unity and the encouragement of this congregation. You leave here and you go, oh, I love my church family. And you take, your, you take a lighter heart and a deeper purpose in Christ and you can't even check into your hotel because you're talking to the clerk about how awesome Christ is and how wonderful his church is. That's the kind of mission-mindedness we want to have. And the lesson here is about the church in Antioch. About the church in Antioch. But Jesus' prayer, which is what we brought back up, Jesus' prayer had an interesting conclusion to it. You noticed, right? At At the end of verse 21. Our unity... Our unity, says Jesus, is so that the world may believe that you have sent me. When Christ's church is united and loving and serving and intent on following his word, people go, huh, what's going on over there? I'd like to hear about this. When Christ's church is divided and throwing rocks at each other and spitting and angry and lonely and hurt and disobeying his word, people say, no, no, thank you. Not interested. And that has happened in country after country after country in group after group after group. And it's easy to happen here, too, if we don't stay intent. We, we, we stay humble in these things. It is so, it is so sad when you try to uh, talk to folks about Christ or won't you come join us at church and people say, no, 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 I've seen that. No, thank you. And you go, ah. Our unity, Jesus said, is so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And those who come and go from here and serving on mission uh, mission work, go with confidence because you are loving and united and intent on following his word. Because you are serving. Because you've got their back. Because you're proclaiming Christ in this community. We just had a look at Acts chapter 11. So go back there in verse 19. And we'll look at a church who was an active mission-minded church. Notice in verse 19, then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. Don't have a map here to talk about how broadly spread out that is, but these are, these are Jews who traveled a great distance to find a place to settle down because they were being attacked so badly back in Jerusalem. So we've jumped here from Acts chapter 7 and the beginning of 8 all the way to Acts 11. A couple of different stories were told in the middle there, Paul being uh, brought to Christ and, uh, 
and Cornelius and his family, the first uh, Gentiles being baptized into Christ. And now verse in chapter 11, we now go back to where we were and say, you know, when that persecution happened, people went all over the place. And this is the, the description of the church that met in Antioch. They spoke the world to no, word to no one except Jews alone because they didn't understand that the gospel was made for everybody. So they're just teaching Jews, which is expected. Christ was the Messiah to the Jewish nation. We had to, they had to learn that the lesson and the salvation was for everybody. But there were some men from Cyprus, notice where these guys are from, from Cyprus and Cyrene who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks as well. There's no reason we can't teach Jesus to everybody. Preaching the good news that the Lord Jesus, that the good news of the Lord Jesus, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a look at the words. I'm in verse 21. And a large number who believed turned to the Lord. Well, this information gets back to Jerusalem to Jerusalem. And the church, the, the, the apostles had stayed in Jerusalem, apparently. So the main church leaders are still back in Jerusalem. And they go, huh. When they hear this news, they send sent Barnabas out, Mr. Encouragement. And when he arrived, verse 23, and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. There's a longer explanation of how Barnabas could have had this and did have this perspective. He had just heard Peter's story. You have to read uh, Acts chapter 10 and the beginning of chapter 11 to understand that Peter was the one who participated in the first Gentiles becoming Christians. And so Barnabas had been part of learning this. He was a good man, verse 24, and full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And considerable numbers were added to the Lord. And he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year, they met with the church and taught considerable numbers of people. And disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now at this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them named Agabus stood up and indicated by the Spirit that there would be a severe famine all over the world. And this took place in the reign of Claudius. To the extent that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of, to the brothers and sisters living in Judea, back in, in uh, Jerusalem. And they did this by sending it with Barnabas and Saul to the elders. Interesting part of this story, notice that, that uh, this was the, the famine that took place during the reign of Claudius. You remember that one, right? That was during the reign of Claudius. And I bring that up not because it, it magnifies the story, but it specifies the story. Not to our benefit a lot directly, but these are not once upon a time stories. These are pieces of history. This is what happened, being accurately told by an expert historian named Luke. There are so many more evidences to your faith. The, the, the mounting number of evidences that God is the designer of all things, that life came from his hand, is being proved by science over and over and over again. You can be confident in the serious look at science, obviously by scripture, but in the sciences and say, there had to be a designer and a creator. In this case, you can take a serious look at history. History set shows you that the Bible is accurate. Archaeology repeatedly, and there's some amazing things going on in the last 10 or 20 years, to show you that the Bible is completely accurate in the stories that it tells, so that when you read it, you can know, you don't have to guess that these things are true. Acts 13, 1 through 3. Three, flip over there, please. Now there were prophets and teachers at Antioch in the church. There was Barnabas, 
Simeon, who is called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought by Herod the Tetrarch. So that's one of the kings. So this man was working for the local king. And Saul, while they were serving the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit sent Barnabas and said, sent Barnabas, sent Barnabas and Saul apart from me for the work which I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. Twice in that verse, we're being told that the church fasted. And we chuckled at ourselves a few weeks ago as we were sending away the Smith family and we had a feast out here. And we said, hmm, they fasted, we're eating. The Bible doesn't have a lot of commands about fasting, but it does have some significant examples about fasting. We're not commanded to fast in the New Testament scriptures, but it's a great piece of self-discipline. It is a great way to focus your mind on God in prayer, in his word, in your own heart. They fasted and it prepared them to be a mission congregation. And this is the first group they sent out for this kind of a mission. <clears throat> now, let's look at what, this, what we've read about this congregation. Let's look at what we've read about this congregation in these times. They were evangelistic locally. They weren't sitting on their hands, sitting on their money and saying, well, somebody's got to do some work, so let's send somebody to another continent and have them do the work for us. They were evangelistic locally. They were presenting Christ. They were running from persecution, remember? This was not their home city. They did not grow up in Antioch. They came to Antioch fleeing for their lives losing their businesses, losing their, their livestock, losing their farms, losing whatever they had, fleeing for their lives. And they came here and were so excited about Christ that they had to tell people. And it didn't matter who they told. They had unity across cultures. They were excited. Whoever needed to hear it, whoever needed to hear it, and they had reasons and an explanation and an example in their lives not to cross culture because, after all, Christ was Jewish. Jesus was Jewish. They had to be told and explained to them that God in Christ is for all peoples. Look at Galatians 3 for a moment. Galatians 3, 26 through 29. For you are all, this is predominantly a Gentile area that uh, Galatia, the Galatian churches are being described. And Paul writes, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. We're connected to God in Christ by faith. And look how we do it. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. The first step of faith, the first thing we say when we know that Jesus is Lord, Jesus is the resurrected Messiah, the son of the living God. He died for my sins. The first thing you do is you be baptized into him. All of us who are baptized into Christ have clothed ourselves with Christ. Christ becomes our, our covering. Christ's blood forgives us our sins at that point. All through our act of faith. All are sons of God through faith. There is neither. This is huge. This is huge to their society. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There's no allowance for those religious or cultural differences <clears throat> when coming to Christ. There is neither slave nor free man. Imagine the scope of that difference. <clears throat> How many places had the, <clears throat> excuse me, had the Roman army gone and captured, you know, captured people, conquered and captured and brought back entire groups 
of Phoenicians and, and Syrians and barbarians and wherever else they had gone, Macedonians, and brought them back into their towns and made them slaves. There is neither free man or slave in Christ. That's a huge barrier for a group of people to conquer. We have been taught equality in, in government that all men are created equal since this country was founded. It is supposed to be second nature to us that all individuals are valuable, that every individual is precious before God and have, has equal rights before uh, our government and our society. But that, this was not that kind of culture. This is huge that the church was doing this in Antioch. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. Men and women equally have standing in Christ. Salvation is equal to men and women in Christ. Yes. Again, something that should be second nature to us, but not necessary to them. Something they weren't necessarily taught in all of their cultures. You, for you are all one in Christ. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants and heirs according to the promise. So Paul goes all the way back to the promises God had from the very beginning. They're all made yes in Christ. So they were evangelistic locally. They had unity across cultures. They were careful with the word. Notice when the church in Jerusalem said, heard about all these folks being baptized into Christ up there in Antioch. They go, what in the world? What is going on up there? Barnabas, would you go check it out? And Barnabas went and checked it out. And he reported that they were being taught properly and following Christ properly and being united properly and applying the gospel properly. And he was encouraged. They were carefully following the word of Christ. They weren't going off on their own. They weren't uh, uh, ship, slipping aside things. Well, we're not in Jerusalem anymore. We can do whatever we want up here. They were following and obeying the very same things they were taught when they came to Christ in Jerusalem. They were teachable and encouraging. They gathered teachers around them. That list of teachers we had, they gathered teachers. They were a magnet for people to come and teach them about Christ. They wanted Barnabas to come up there. Barnabas was so excited, he stayed there for over a year. <clears throat> and when they heard there was a need, when they heard there was help that, that was needed, there was a famine coming along, they were generous. They were generous. I pulled up yesterday uh, as you, you all were helping the Williams family move from one house to another in the Valley area. I couldn't even find a place to park. They have a large parking area in front of their uh, townhouse apartment where they used to live. I couldn't find a place to pull up. It was all covered by your vehicles. There were so many people who showed up yesterday. There were so many pickup trucks and trailers and cars that they moved their entire household in one trip. People were crowded in and out the door. You had to wait in line to get in the door to go pick up something and put, bring it back out. In one trip, they loaded up a bunch of cars on this side of the valley and, and, to put, it in, and put it into a house on that side of the valley. It was amazing. They were generous to help. You've been generous with your money. You've been generous with your time. You've been generous with your energy. You've been generous with your hearts. That's necessary. That's a sign of Christ speaking to you. Keep doing so more and more. And they were eager, they were eager to send, eager to support. As soon as they heard that Barnabas and Saul, who gets to be called Paul very quickly after this, Barnabas and Paul are being sent out by God to teach others. They were eager to make that happen and generous to make it a success. So at the end of that trip, Paul and Barnabas go out. It's a fantastic story. I encourage you to read it through uh, Acts uh, 11, 12, and 13. And at the end of Acts 14, the end of Acts 14, 
They, this is Paul and Barnabas, they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Atlia, Italia. And from there they sailed to Antioch. They went back home to their home congregation, in that case anyway, where they had been entrusted to Antioch, where they had been entrusted to the grace of God for the work that they had accomplished. You all are laying in other people's hands and hearts trust for the work. And when they had arrived and gathered the church together, they began to report. They had a meeting. They stood in front of the entire congregation and said, let me tell you what happened in this place. Let me tell you what happened in this place. Let me tell you the story about, and they ate together and they talked together and they talked together. Report all the things that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they spent a long time with the apostles. Well, there's your list. Locally evangelistic, unity across barriers and cultures, careful with the word, teachable and encouraging, generous to help, eager to support and send. And finally, being welcoming home of your workers as they come back. We'll have workers coming home soon, this year and next year. Uh, I get to go in a week with Brady, uh, younger Brady, uh, to Brazil to meet one of your workers and to work with him for a couple of weeks and visit there as we go down to hear from Adam. I encourage you to get on Facebook and follow the Smiths as they report regularly what they're doing and, and put pictures up of the things going on in Albania. But there's a lot more from this congregation and a lot more places than just those two. We need to be the unified, focused, love, loving, locally serving, evangelistic congregation that makes long-term or short-term, nearby or distant mission works successful. And we always praise God through that. If there's any this morning who have not been brought to Christ, if you're ready, if your faith is ready to proclaim that Christ is Lord, the Son of the living God resurrected from the dead, if you're ready to make him your Lord and be baptized into him, we ask you to Take this opportunity to let us know that. If you think about that and want to know more, we can study with you. Please let us know that. If you have any other needs that you want prayers or whatever otherwise for, please come forward and let us know while we stand and sing the song that's been selected. <laughs>